So if we think about acceleration during any task, it's normally, for the majority of sports, um, force is produced through the lower body. So if we're looking at sprinting, jumping, changing direction, etc., rapid extension of hip, knee, and ankle, um, that doesn't necessarily mean full extension, but it's rapid extension of hip, knee, and ankle. Very high force is produced in relatively short periods of time. The orientation of the body doesn't really matter because when we're sprinting, our body's just leaning forwards uh, slightly different angle but it's still that rapid extension of hip knee and ankle and there's a very strong correlation between performance in weightlifting exercises and jumping sprinting change of direction uh, now again it's it's a correlation that doesn't mean there's cause and effect you can get all sorts of weird and wonderful spurious correlations which mean nothing at all however when we then look at some training interventions and when we see that if you improve performance in some of these tasks or you improve even rapid isometric force production during something like an isometric mid-thigh pull, which mimics, mimics that second pull phase of the clean. If that improves, we generally improve sprint, jump, change of direction performance. It's not really surprising that these tasks are going to enhance rapid force production. And if you actually have a look at what happens within the lower body while we're performing these tasks, and the nice thing is it's easy to create progressive overload. Welcome, Paul, to Evidence Strong Show. My pleasure to have you. If you could please briefly introduce yourself. Yep, no problem. First of all, thanks for the invitation. I'm Professor Paul Comfort. I'm a professor in strength and conditioning at the University of Salford, where I've been for the last 15 years now. So sort of probably 50% of my time is research, 50% of is admin and um, teaching our students predominantly on our uh, master's program in strength and conditioning. Uh, and then I also work with a, a, quite a few of the local teams on a sort of consultancy basis as well, uh, whether that's testing and monitoring athletes, whether it's um, feedback on the, the sort of um, training programs and periodization strategies they're using, et cetera. Sounds amazing. I invited you for this interview because you authored a paper titled National Strength and Conditioning Association Position Statement on Weightlifting for Sports Performance. Why this paper was needed and a bit of a context. Okay, so I got invited to um, pull a group of um, experts together to put this position statement together. Um, got invited by the National Strength and Conditioning Association, but I think the need was there because people don't always know how to how to apply some of the research, or they're not aware of the research. There's so much. I think this, the, I think the manuscript's got over 300 references in it. So you can't expect you know the average coach to go away and read those 300 references. This took probably a about 18 months, pull the whole thing together with a group of experts. Um, I think the need was there to try and give something that's very comprehensive and a one-stop shop of this is the research, this is how to try and implement it. This may be, you know, the most appropriate approach to doing it, but also leaving it broad enough so that people can apply the findings of, of this um, position statement to their individual athletes in the individual sports, etc. So the paper is packed with goodies, so I'm super excited to dive into it. So maybe let's start with a bit of a comparison, how weightlifting is comparable to sports, and that will answer the question why we should use it, and then also how it differs. Okay, so in, in terms of how it's comparable to sports, if we think about acceleration during any task, it's normally, for the majority of sports, um, force is produced through the lower body. So if we're looking at sprinting, jumping, changing direction, etc., rapid extension of hip, knee, and ankle, um, that doesn't necessarily mean full extension. If you look at somebody when they're sprinting, they don't reach full extension. They um, start to flex and go through the recovery phase prior to that. But it's rapid extension of hip, knee, and ankle. Very high force is produced in relatively short periods of time. The orientation of the body doesn't really matter because when we're sprinting, our body's just leaning forwards uh, slightly different angle, but it's still that rapid extension of hip, knee, and ankle. And there's a very strong correlation between performance in weightlifting exercises and jumping, sprinting, change of direction. Uh, now, again, it's it's a correlation. That doesn't mean there's cause and effect. You can get all sorts of weird and wonderful spurious correlations, which mean nothing at all. However, when we then look at some training interventions and when we see that if you improve performance in some of these tasks or you improve even rapid isometric force production during something like an isometric mid-thigh pull, which mimics, mimics that second pull phase of the clean. If that improves, we generally improve sprint, jump, change of direction performance. It's not really surprising that these tasks are going to um, enhance rapid force production. And if you actually have a look at what happens within the lower body while we're performing these tasks. And the nice thing is, it's easy to cre create progressive overload. If we try and just 
you know, how do you progressively overload a sporting task to produce a higher force? You can't just keep adding load to the individual because, you know, if it's a jump, suddenly they can't jump because the load's too heavy. And if it's a sprint, um, you completely change their sprint mechanics. However, you can still use, you know, heavy sleds to push or to drag and improve force production characteristics. It's just not as easy as performing some of these different weightlifting variations. So that's the the, the different and similar part. Did, did you cover everything we wanted? Um, I suppose the... Yeah, in terms of similarity, the, the differences really are the fact that we can load these exercises really easily. We've got a huge variation of weightlifting movements that we can perform to emphasize different force production characteristics. You know, we can do something from a static position, um, so we can do a, a clean pull from the floor or from the knee, or we can go for a hang pull where we stimulate the stretch shortening side of the court and may actually train something in a slightly more sport specific nature because most sporting talents use the stretch shortening cycle we can use light loads with certain exercises some are definitely not sort of best suited to light loads to really emphasize that high velocity movement and very rapid force production we can also load them very very heavy especially with the pulling variations whether that's a pull from the floor we can really emphasize um force production now that even though the one is low it still emphasizes rapid force production because when you're performing any of these lifts the aim isn't to just lift the bar off the floor like you people might do with the deadlift you know it may be a controlled pull to the knee but from there even if there's a heavy load you're aiming to move that bar as rapidly as possible which ends up meaning you you have very high rates of force development um, which are really really beneficial over prolonged periods of time as well so yeah in terms of the, the sort of similarities and the difference to sporting movements there's a lot of similarities and I think the problem is when people start thinking about sport specificity and thinking that it must look similar to the sport, they're barking up the wrong tree most of the times. It shouldn't be sport specificity. It's specific adaptations to impose demands. What is the adaptation we need in that athlete, in the muscle, in the tendon, in the neurological system to create the improvement in performance? So if you have an athlete that, that is really, really strong and really efficient at producing force, the only way to make them stronger may be actually to go through a period of hypertrophy because they're very efficient at producing force. So we might need a phase of hypertrophy to increase muscle mass and therefore increase the force production capability. We might have somebody else who's quite muscular, but actually isn't producing particularly high forces or not producing them rapidly. So then we've got to think, well, okay, we've got a big muscular athlete but they can't accelerate as well as we want them to. So we need to focus more rapid force production, possibly reduce body fat to some extent. So we've got to think about the adaptations that we're really after, rather than making a movement look sports specific, where we then generally can't load it as effectively. We can't make the, the force time characteristics of the task anywhere near what you can get when you're in that sport. So it's what are the adaptations we need within the neuromuscular system, the, the tendons, the bones, et cetera, to really get the performance benefits that, that we need for that athlete. Okay. If we could go what derivatives we have available, and then when we divide them into groups, some examples of specific exercises that would go there, and then how we would use them in training and what adaptations we are trying to get. Okay. Brilliant. So if we start off with the catching derivatives, um, then we've got any variations of the clean or the snatch where we catch the bar. And that can be in that full depth position. So, you know, a full depth front squat position or a full depth overhead squat position for the snatch, or it can be catching in the power position. So that shallow squat position above parallel. Um, normally, most people that are non weightlifters will catch, you know, around about a 90 degree knee angle. So only slightly flexed, uh, whereas weightlifters tend to catch that a little bit lower in a, in a power variation. And we can perform those from, from the floor. We can perform them from the knee. We can perform them from mid-thigh or the hip if it's a snatch because you've got that wider grip so the bar's higher up. And then we can also perform them where we add a counter movement into them as well. So you can start, you can deadlift the bar up or pick it up from a rack or off blocks and then hinge down to the knee or we can then just perform that sort of shallow dip to get the bar in the crease of the hip if we're performing a snatch variation or if we are down to mid-thigh if we're performing, performing a clean variation. The things to bear in mind is if we start from the floor and a catch in that full depth position we're performing more work so the more we displace the bar so if you think about the pulling variation there's more work performed if we start at the floor compared to starting at the knee or starting at mid thigh or hip with the snatch and then if we're catching in as deep a squat as we can go we have to perform a squat to get back out of that so there's even more work performed 
Now, that's not a bad thing. However, if we go in season, in team sports, for example, we might want to minimize the amount of work that they're performing close to competitions. You know, if it's match day minus two, so in, in 14 hours time they're competing, we might want to reduce that volume of work. So then we might go with, you know, a mid-thigh power clean. So we've only got a, a shallow range of motion or small range of motion we go through in the propulsive phase. And then we only capture that shallow squat position and then maybe drop that bar back onto some blocks so we don't have to keep picking it back up each time. We've still then got the, you know, a huge amount of intent. But we've still got really high levels of force production and rapid force production, but we're not inducing as much fatigue because we're not having to pull from the floor. And around about 50% of the propulsive phase is that first pull. It is always slow and controlled. It rapidly accelerates speed on the knee. And then we don't have to get back out of the hole and, you know, do a full concentric phase of a squat. So we've got some options there. And then we can also adding the counter movement. If we were going to go from the hip, we'd either, you know, slowly squat down to the bars at the hip over the um, power snatch from the hip, or we can stand upright, dip into that position quickly, stimulate the stretch shortening cycle and make it a little bit more. So it resembles the sort of jumping in those sort of sport specific tasks a little bit more than we would get if we're going down and pausing or, or lifting the bar of blocks. So I think, you know, we've got a, a range of different um, variations that we can use for these. We need to think about the total amount of work performed and how fatiguing they might be. We can lift more weight if we start from the floor, if we're proficient, because there's greater time to apply a force so we can get a higher impulse and we should be able to accelerate the bar to a greater extent if we start from the floor. And then that load will decrease slightly if we go to the knee and decrease slightly if we go to the sort of second pull position. But it's, that doesn't necessarily matter if we're lifting a little bit less load. It might vary by 10%. But actually, if we're still moving with maximal intent, that's probably not going to give us a massive difference in terms of the adaptive responses that we get. However, it will train us to drop underneath the bar and catch quickly if you start at the bar in the crease of the hip or mid-thigh because you, know, you don't have as much time to apply force to the bar, so you really have to emphasize getting it under the bar and capturing it um, effectively. So again, that might be a good um, coaching um, uh, variation to do for an individual to improve their ability to catch the bar back. What would be a purpose for a strength and conditioning coach to use catching derivatives? Well, the catching derivatives give us that we have to get intent. We have to move the bar as rapidly and explosively as possible so that we can displace the bar high enough. If it's a power clean or a power snatch, you know, if it's a power clean to the sternum to catch it, if it's a power snatch, it's probably round about the height of your chin so you can drop underneath and catch. The, the, the benefit is, is it forces the athlete to put in maximum intent. Otherwise you're not successful in the lift. So they are a great addition. Now there's also some discussion over how much that may help with sort of load acceptance, receiving the bar in that position, going from a rapid, propulsive phase, rapid concentric action, relaxing and dropping very quickly so that you can receive the bar either in a power position or that full depth position and embrace yourself. So you go from that rapid concentric action to relaxation, then it's probably isometric. Non-sports athlete, non, non weightlifters, it will probably be an eccentric phase because the bar will be higher, they'll catch it and then ride, the, ride it down. They're not catching just near that peak displacement of the bar necessarily. But there are quite a few benefits, but the primary one that I, that I see is it, the athlete has to move with intent and they don't always do that with some of the pulling derivatives. Some do, but others don't. So the main thing is it really dry, helps to, to drive intent. We may find it has benefits for that sort of um, load absorption, deceleration aspect, bracing, etc. but there isn't enough research in that area to really tell us what all of those benefits are at the moment. Um, and some of that is difficult because, you know, if you put EMG electrodes onto people's um, abdomen to try and look at the, 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 the bracing or on the quadriceps, as you perform that lift, the bar comes up close to the thigh, normally takes the um, EMG electrodes off the thigh, same on the abdomen if it's staying close by. So, yeah, whether that really helps with bracing, um, eccentric muscle actions, isometric actions, we just don't have enough detail there at the moment. And it will vary dramatically between weightlifters who catch the bar near its peak displacement and non-weightlifters who you will see, you know, the bar come up and sometimes they're waiting for it to come down so they can receive the bar. Then you will get very, very high eccentric forces and the bar's dropping from probably, you know, six to 12 inches above you. And that's not a nice position to be in, which um, I'm sure anyone that's done any weightlifting has experienced that. But I did pull that a bit higher. I dropped too quick. Okay. So how about pulling the, the rivet? 
Okay, so the, the pulling derivatives can be very, very similar to um, the catching derivatives. We just exclude that catch phase. Now, that could be useful because then we can use loads greater than your 1 RM because we're no longer um, limited by how how we can displace the bar to catch in whichever um, catching variation we might have been doing previously. So we can go up above that 100%. And weightlifters have used these variations for years. You know, you look at um, some of the published weightlifting programs of very good competitive weightlifters, and they'll regularly be doing clean pulls with loads above 1RM. It just hasn't really been used um, until some of the research we published probably 12, 13 years ago. It hadn't really been used that extensively in, in not weightlifters. So the nice thing is it means that if an, if an individual struggles to get into a good and safe catch position, and we've all seen people trying to catch and you know their elbows are really low and they're, they're trying to use their biceps or they're leaning back to catch it, and they're in an awful position. So we can then still train the athlete without worrying about that catch component if they are compromising them themselves and increasing the risk of injury from a poor catch position. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't train them and coach them to be able to perform all these variations. But you can see it with non-weightlifters quite regularly when they, you know, once you're getting up close to their 1RM, technique breaks down. So we can't then train those fire loads unless we eliminate the, the catch. But we should still be training them to be able to catch where we can. You also end up with athletes who, you know, have been injured. So again, if you go back to people in collision sports like rugby league, rugby union, American football, um, Australian rules football, a lot of them have got you know, quite a few injuries to their shoulder, their elbow, their wrist, they might not be able to get into this position or overhead to catch. That doesn't mean we can't do weightlifting variations with them. We can just do them and exclude the catch, but they still get those propulsive benefits. You know, the, the main thing we're aiming for is to develop rapid force production characteristics to propel and accelerate the athlete or the athlete in the bar back. So we can still do that without catching. And it really allows us to go to those much higher loads. On the other end of the continuum, we can think about things like the hang high pull, which as long as the person isn't doing an upright row that I mentioned earlier, and it is really propelling that bar up with the legs. So the bar will travel up on its own and we're not really adding too much with the upper body until the bar reaches its peak, peak displacement and then we use the upper body to start the deceleration of the barbell. And then we've also got the, the jump stroke, which Dr. Tim Suckermel's popularized, where it's really just a hip hinge down to the knee. And then you jump from that. And if you hip hinge down to the knee, the shins are vertical, you've got sufficient knee extension, you have to perform a transition. That that scoop or double knee bend or whatever you want to refer to has to happen. You can't jump with a near extended knee. So you naturally perform that, you accelerate right the way through the full range of motion and you jump. Now, again, that's great if we're down at loads at about 30% of 1RM, up towards 45, maybe up to 60% of 1RM repetition maximum. Um, in the research, and I know Dr. Sukumel has used loads up as high as 80 or 85% of 1RM. From my experience, most people, once you exceed the sort of 45 to 60%, they don't put in a maximum in 10 because, again, they've got to think about it, landing, catching it, flexing the knee and hit, but then not bouncing the bar off the front of the thigh, which I've seen a few people do at times, which doesn't look very pleasant. Uh, it's certainly going to leave a little bit of bruising there. But for the much lower loads, we can be truly ballistic and, you know, we don't really want our athletes to try and perform a clean or a power clean or a snatch or a power snatch for 40% of 1RM because they won't put it maximum in 10 or the bar's going to go far too high. You know, if you use 40% of 1RM on a snatch or a power snatch, that's not going to be very comfortable on your shoulder because the bar's still moving up if you're going down. So with really light loads, something like the jump shrug and the hang high pull are better. Again, if it's the hang high pull, the really, really low loads, the 30 to 45%, again, you probably don't put in a maximum in 10 because the bar is going to displace so high. So something like the hang high pull might be better from, you know, your 50% up towards the 70% of one repetition maximum where you have to put in in 10, but it's not so heavy that it encourages the athlete to pull on the bar with the upper body. And again, these these are all really useful in terms of training either the, the, the velocity end of a continuum or that force end and we can also use them um, in a similar way to what I've described previously with the catching derivatives if we add that counter movement into it. So if we pull from the knee, so you've got no real counter movement in there apart from that transition phase, or if we start stood upright, hinge down to the knee, and then um, rapidly go through that transition and second pull phase, we actually end up with much higher um, forces, rates of force development, power, but 
the nice thing is, is we can really go to either end of that load continuum. Uh, we can use much higher loads with most pulling variations, and we can use lighter loads with a jump shrug and a hang high pull. Okay, so the advantage of using pulling would be that you can load it more than you could load any other derivative. Definitely. So we can load much higher with most of the pulling variations, and then we can use lighter loads, something like a jump shrug, but you still get that maximal intent because you're aiming to jump. Also, the, the advantage would be that you don't have catch, which can be hard in terms of injuries. Or also, you may want to not engage upper body and therefore use pulling to force the lower body use by the athlete. Yeah, definitely. Okay, pressing now. Okay, so the pressing variations and pressing derivatives are, are great because, well, one, we can fall athletes into thinking um, non-weightlifters. Um, in terms of athletes into thinking that they're training their upper body, but it's all lower body, or it should all be lower body. So again, close close to the day of competition, we can get people performing some relatively high load, very sort of ballistic stretch shortening cycle movements without them thinking that they're going to get sore because you've got such a shallow range of motion with that dip in drive phase. You know, as we go from being stood upright into that um, dorsiflex position, keeping the trunk upright, it's only a small range of motion. We, because it's a shallow range of motion, we have to produce really high forces because we only have a limited amount of time to produce force. So it really emphasizes that rapid force production. And the nice thing is, again, we've got to get the bar high enough, whether it's for a push press, jerk, split jerk, whatever it might be, um, so that we're not pressing out with the upper body or we're not emphasizing a press with the upper body. So it helps to really drive into tent with individuals. So the nice thing is for these exercises that Actually, if we use the same load, we get exactly the same um, force power rate of force development because the propulsive phase is the same. You go through the same range of motion with maximal intent. So whether it's a push, press, push, jerk, split jerk, if the loads are same, we get the same acute stimulus and therefore should get the same adaptive responses over time. The advantage that we have if we go from a push press to a push jerk uh, or a power jerk, depending on whatever term you want to use for it, is that we don't have to displace the bar as high. So then we can use a slightly heavier load. And then if you go to a split jerk, again, you normally drop your center of mass and capture the lower height or the barbells at a lower height. So again, we can take the load up even further. If you can perform the the you know the push jerk, but it do it as a squat jerk and catch full depth, fantastic. We can use an even higher load. Never met a non-weight lifter that can do that competently with a heavy load. So, you know, we're probably not going to be using that with our team sport athletes. We've then also got those variations that, you know, I've been able to do these um, overhead lifts from behind the neck. So it gives us, again, greater variation if the athlete can get into that position safely and competently. So we've got a whole range of these different tasks, which we can use interchangeably almost. Yes, if we decrease the requirement for displacing the bar particularly high, we can use a slightly heavier load so we can emphasize force more. But again, these exercises are great because they force you to use a really high intent. They introduce that stretch shortening cycle, that rapid dip down and then drive back up. And they're pretty easy to coach as well. That's one of the really nice things is that, you know, it doesn't take, if somebody can do a front squat, as an example, um, even a shallow front squat, and they can do a military press and press the bar overhead, they can do a push press. They should be able to do a push jerk. And if they can go into a split squat position or a lunge, they should be able to do a split jerk. So, most athletes, if they've never done any weightlifting variations, these are really, really too easy to introduce and drive that maximum intent. So so let's go with, as a strength and conditioning coach or weightlifting coach working with athletes in other sports, how you would be moving throughout the season and how you would be pulling all these different derivatives to serve the purpose or the adaptations you want to achieve. Okay, so I think... You know, if we're looking at a traditional team sport um, situation where they've got maybe six to eight weeks worth of preseason, what we've got to do is be thinking, first of all, what do I want my athletes doing in season? Which exercises, what lifts do I want them to perform to emphasize certain characteristics? Let's make sure we've refined their technique. We've given them the strong foundations at the beginning with all these variations so I can use them effectively later on. So the decision making for which exercises you use really come from, well, what do I want to use in season? So... Let's make sure the athletes are competent, competent and can, can perform all the tasks we want to perform later on. But it's really, really crucial. You can perform the higher volume stuff in, in seasons. So you can perform the, uh, sorry, in the pre-season. So you can perform the cleans and the snatches then. 
um, where you've got that greater amount of work performed from pulling from the floor and then catching in a, in a full squat position. You're probably not going to use those in season with most team sport athletes because they're physically, they're more demanding. If the athletes are a little bit sore from competing in season, especially in team sports, uh, if you look at something like football or soccer in Europe, they might be uh, playing two, sometimes three games a week. So there's limited time there. So we've got to optimize recovery, still hit them with a high load training stimulus, but something that's not going to be fatiguing and something they can do if they are a little bit sore in some areas. So once we go in season, then we're really looking at, well, what, what do I need to improve with my athlete? So we have to do, you know, the regular assessment and monitoring with the athlete to really identify, well, what do they need to focus on? We've been really lucky over the last year um, at the university. We've tested probably seven or 800 um, football players, so soccer players. And apart from the goalkeepers, probably 95% of them just need to get stronger. They're efficient at using the force uh, all the strength that they've got and producing that force efficiently. So some of them might be able to produce 90%, 85 to 90% of their maximum isometric force within the first 250 milliseconds. If you look at something like the dynamic strength index, you know, the ratio between their isometric force production and the ballistic force production, um, they're up at 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So they can produce 80 or 90% of their isometric force production during dynamic ballistic tasks. The biggest problem is they're weak. So for them, in season, we're not going to be doing a lot of, or, or shouldn't be doing a lot of more power-based type training with lighter loads. They're efficient at doing that. They can jump high, they can sprint fast. We have to get them stronger. So for those individuals, it would be some of the higher load movements. So pulling variations, some squat variations within there as well. Whatever squatting pattern benefits them, we might have some higher load um, overhead pressing derivatives in there to drive that intent. If we're looking at two games in a week, the training session closest to, to game day or match day, whichever you want to refer to it as, we're probably doing those exercises where we're limiting the total volume of work. So probably going with things, things like your push presses to drive intent, but it's only a small range of motion. It shouldn't fatigue them. Maybe something like, uh, you know, a pull from the knee or a hang pull and so still a squat variation of, of some, some type in there, but keeping the volumes much, much lower. And then probably alternating between sort of strength, speed and speed strength and regularly evaluating those, those individuals. The the biggest problem that we have when we're working with, with some team sport athletes, so football or soccer being a, a good example, is that because they don't generally have a good training history, we have to be cautious and slowly and incrementally add volume and load to them. So what I mean by training history is training by doing proper strength and conditioning work with high loads, with these types of exercises. They'll have been playing football in an academy setting normally from the age of nine or 10 years of age, but just haven't really done what we would consider high load training. It's generally all the sort of sets of 10 to 15 repetitions. So we have to make sure we progressively and incrementally load them. What we don't want to happen is them to suddenly become sore. And, you know, the hamstrings are sore, so they think they've got a bit of an injury, but it's not. It's just delayed onset muscle soreness. That's normal. It's just that we gave them a novel stimulus or higher volume than normal, slightly higher load, etc. When we're implementing these in, in sporting situations where they're not weightlifters, we just have to look at, well, what is their training history? What are they used to doing? And how do we progressively and incrementally add this into their training? And how can we do it so that they buy into it? They see some improvements. So... You're probably not going to start with your the, the loads that you would consider ideal. We're not going to be that 70 to 90% of one RM with a power clean or a power snatch, etc. It's going to be much lighter. The volumes will be much lower, but we'll slowly and progressively increase those over time. You'll still get an adaptive response from it. It won't be as rapid as the response we might like, but it prevents the athlete ending up being sore or demotivated or picking up a little bit of an injury or going into the, the, the game or the match feeling a little bit fatigued. So we always have to be a little bit cautious with how we do that. But ultimately, it's normally in season, certainly for all this lower body work, is rotating between speed, strength, strength, speed, depending on the, the needs of the athlete. If we evaluate them objectively and identify, is it the rapid force production or is it maximum force production they need to emphasize now? And even if we've planned, you know, a block of four, six, eight weeks of strength, speed, and then into speed, strength, if they're not as strong as we want them after that four-week block, we maybe go carry on for another four week block and, and keep that progressing. But just being mindful then of the total volume of work they're performing with all their other sports specific training. You know, we can't use a training program we would use with weightlifters where 
their or technical and tactical training is lifting. We have to go consider that with most other sports, they'll be doing all their technical and tactical training, especially team sports. They'll be on the course or on the pitch for hours per day doing all the other physically demanding exercise. So the strength and conditioning then is to really supplement that and enhance the force production characteristics so they can perform better in their technical and tactical training. So in the season, the time it is just rotating between strength, speed, speed, strength, and evaluating appropriately. All right. So we could go through, we could go from another angle and try to go absolute strength, how you would go about thinking about that, then strength, endurance, speed, strength, and strength, speed. Yeah. If we want to develop, you know, absolute or maximal strength, then we're going to be using some of the higher load weightlifting, pulling derivatives. And again, that's it might be from the floor, it might be from, from blocks at the knee, it might be um, a hang variation, whatever suits that athlete and whatever they're comfortable and competent at. But we definitely use some high, higher load, uh, you know, above 100% of their one repetition maximum. Probably higher if we're going from, uh, if we're doing a hang or from the knee or from mid-thigh, then we go from the floor. Uh, because most people will struggle a little bit with that full first pull variation once we get up to the 130, 140% of one repetition maximum. Some can perform it really, really well. Others, the technique starts to break down. And we'd normally start, we can incrementally increase that load. So we might start at 120% of one RM and slowly add load each week um, if we're really emphasizing force production. We'll also have some, you know, squatting type variations, some squatting pattern in there as well to make sure we're getting that um, increase in force production throughout that full range of motion with, with a squatting type activity. And again, that will generally be to suit that athlete, whether it's a front squat, back squat, split squat variation, depending on their mobility and their competence of these different exercises. But then we'll also have a little bit later on, we might have um, some more moderate load exercise in this. We might have a, a, you know, a hang power snatch or something like that down at the 70% of water M. So we still, we're emphasizing force uh, maximum force production, but we still got something at a slightly lighter load where it's more more ballistic and, and uh, um, higher movement velocities and making sure that then when we transition from that absolute or maximum strength, maybe to speed strength, that they're still used to really moving with intent and moving at higher velocities. And it doesn't take the first few training sessions to get them back to, you know, being snappy and moving as quickly as we want them to. Okay, so that's absolute strength when they move to speed strength. So we can go with this one next. Yep. So with the speed strength aspect of it, then again, we've still got to use those normal sort of principles that we'd have in terms of the most fatiguing and more demanding exercises first. So within the speed strength, we might go with some lower load snatch variant, power snatch variations, because then we can really emphasize a moderate load, you know, the sort of 70, 75 percent of what around displacing the bar higher so it really helps to get the athlete focused on moving with intent and um, because the bar's got to get so high again if they're not competent at um, getting into that overhead position and catching then we might use a, a a clean variation instead at the same time we can still use something like the overhead lifts but it's a much much shallower range of motion so certainly closer to the day of competition we might go with something like a, an overhead lift because then the total amount of work they perform is less because you only um, squat into that sort of shallow squatting position. So we can use a combination of those types of exercises. We can include things like the hang high pull or a jump shrug. So if we've been doing something at 70 to 80% of one RM with something like a hang power snatch, we might then use the jump shrug down at you know, your 30 to 40% of one repetition maximum. So we train at much sort of higher velocities there. We're definitely going to have some more sort of ballistic and plyometric type exercises as well to really get that reactive component. And then towards the end of the workout, we're probably still going to have some form of squatting variation in there as well to maintain maximum strength or maximum force production. So if we take away that really high load stimulus, we will start to get over a period of weeks, a bit of a decline in maximum force production. But that could be as something as simple as, you know, during the during that absolute or maximum strength phase, they might have been doing five sets of five reps at 85% of their one repetition maximum. Now we might still use that 85%, but it might be three sets of three, which is then completely non-fatiguing, a much lower volume, but a high enough neurological stimulus if we give them something like that once per week to maintain that maximum force production capability. Uh, and again, we can decide where that high load squat goes. Do we do it as a complex, you know, um, and use some form of complex or contrast training with 
a high load squat and a plyometric task or a high load squat and a jump stroke. We could potentially pair those up depending on the amount of time the athlete's got available um, for training and how efficient we need to be. With that type of approach though, we know that strong athletes get that sort of post activation performance enhancement in shorter periods of time of about four minutes and weaker athletes might take longer, but we can still use it for time efficiency. You might not get that potentiation effect if you use a shorter rest period, but if you're constrained with the time that you've got with the athlete, it's generally not detrimental. Um, so that's not necessarily a, a major problem. You'll still get that the high load neuromuscular stimulus. You just don't really realize the full performance enhancing effect of doing a high load activity first, followed by that lower load, more ballistic, plyometric type activity. Okay, and now how, how you would change it to achieve strength speed ad adaptation? Okay, so the strength speed is going to fall somewhere in between the the maximum or the absolute strength and the speed strength. So we're going to have more of the moderate load type activities in there with moderate to high loads. So we might still use some high load pulling variations, just not as high as we'd use the absolute strength. We'll probably have some hang power cleans or power clean variations within there with that sort of 70 to 90% of one repetition maximum from the push press or push jerk in there and then some high load squatting variations. At this point, we probably don't need too much of the, the plyometric or the lower load ballistic type training in there, certainly within a standard training session, because if we're looking at most team sports, you can integrate the ballistic and the plyomet that plyometric training into their warmups before they go onto the court or the pitch and they're doing some technical and tactical training. If it is a court, if it's, you know, volleyball and basketball, we probably don't need a lot of jumping anyway, because they do so much in their training. So if we do any jumping with them, it's going to be very high intensity, high quality, but low volumes. And again, we, you know, one of the things we can do is then put some of these types of more ballistic and plyometric training when it's strength speed, keep them out of the, the gym based session if we can, and make sure that's included in warm ups, technical and tactical training. Most people do prehab sessions, pre-activation sessions for whatever those, those terms really mean. The best thing to do to pre-activate a muscle is do an appropriate warm-up for it and go through these exercises with, you know, progressively heavier loads. That will get everything fully active. Rehabilitation, again, I'm not sure what that is because the best um, stimulus for adaptation and a decreased risk of injury is strength and good movement qualities. There's sufficient evidence to show us that if you're stronger, you're more tolerant and resilient as long as you move well. But people have those types of things built in, especially within team sports. So if we've got that time, let's look at using that to train landing mechanics. Let's improve their movement quality. And let's use the time that we have available then um, to really ingrain those movement patterns, landing strategy, etc. Okay, so let's move to strength endurance. Okay, so for, for the strength endurance, you know, we've got to be using those, those higher volumes, the higher repetition ranges. So this is where we need to be careful of selecting the most appropriate exercises so we're not inducing an excessive amount of fatigue and causing technical failure. Now, again, we can do that with some pulling variations where we exclude the catch phase if the athlete's um, technique starts to break down. And again, we can even do that so that maybe the first five, six repetitions they catch and thereafter, if they're doing another six repetitions, um, they just do the pulls for the last six repetitions of a set of 12. We can also include things like cluster sets if we need to with shorter rest periods, especially with some of these um, exercises, they might need to reapply chalk to their hands as you go in through a set of 12 to 15 repetitions. You know, that you, you can start to lose, lose grip a little bit. Uh, or they may be using straps as well. But we can we need to be selective over which of these tasks we actually use so that we don't actually start increasing the risk of injury. You use them as cluster sets, etc. Try and use the exercises which don't have the highest level of, you know, technical demand. So we're probably not going to be doing a clean or a snatch at this point. You may get away with power cleans, power snatches, if we had a, a, a short um, rest period in between. So get to six reps, 10 seconds rest, then go again. But the pulling variations are probably the better options. I'd probably even avoid something like the, the jump shrug, anything more than about 30% one repetition maximum, because we need good landing mechanics each time. However, the one thing to bear in mind is if you... If you watch weightlifters performing these, if we've got a weightlifter perform a set of 12, they'll pause in between. They'll regrip, they'll compose themselves, they naturally apply a cluster set approach. It's not one repetition, two repetition, three repetition, four. There's that pause. That doesn't always happen with other athletes. Sometimes they rush through it because they know they've got to get through the set. 
So again, we can coach them to try and uh, sort of reduce some of the issues associated with that and give them that bit of feedback. The one thing I really like with adding in a little bit of a cluster set approach with this, we get the high volume in there of whatever the exercise is, but we've got maybe a 10, 15, 20 second opportunity to give the athlete a little bit of feedback. And again, we can, we can almost do that where we can partner people up if we need to be time efficient or we're limited with equipment as well. So you'd normally be doing your sets of you know, anything from 10 to 15 repetitions and just choose some of these more appropriately. So the, the pulling variations are great for doing this. And as I said a moment ago, we can do some where we include the catches early on. And then for the, the later repetitions, we can eliminate that catch phase if the technique starts to break down or when it starts to break down. The push press variations, push press, push jerk, they're really good for doing this as well, especially the push press because it's the least technically demanding. But again, we're still going to be having something like um, squatting variations, Romanian deadlifts, etc. in there. Although if we're doing lots of hand pulls uh, and we're hip hinging down to the knee, you might not want to do a high volume of uh, things like Romanian deadlifts or good mornings on the same day because we've still got exactly the same movement pattern that's happening at that point. And most of it when it comes to the strength, endurance, that sort of hypertrophy range is knowing your athlete and working with them closely to make sure that, you know, if technique is breaking down, you're intervening quickly. You're giving them a bit, a bit of feedback and then letting them continue. But the good thing is we can really build up work capacity with some of these exercises. And you can even do things at this phase where you might pull to the knee and pause and then continue the pull from there and give them a bit of feedback. Check that the postural control is right and the positioning and the technique is as good as it can be. Not for all 10 to 15 repetitions, maybe the first three or four, or maybe you've got to five, then give them a brief rest and then they go again. We can go with short rest periods in between the sets, but again, for the more technically demanding exercises, we probably want a slightly longer rest period, let some of the, the lactate and the acid dissipate so that the technique isn't breaking down because of reduced coordination and movement, etc. But some of the other exercises, your squatting variations, hip hinge movements, and the non-weight lifting variations, we can use that more traditional strength endurance approach with it. Okay, so we covered... Uh, the derivatives, what options we have and how to use them. We went through adaptations. I think now we should move to coaching weightlifting exercises and what are the rules or the tips you would have? It depends whether you're a complete novice. If you are a complete novice and you've got an athlete, that's, and we see this quite a lot, uh, an athlete that is great at all your know, normal sort of strength training, powerlifting type movements, but not very, never really done any weightlifting exercises. The best approach to be seems to be a, a you know that sort of top down approach. If we know that they can they can squat, they can hip hinge, they can do the basic movements. It's relatively easy if they can get in a good front squat position. Let's go with and they can do an overhead squat. Let's go with a mid thigh pull into a mid thigh power clean. Let's go with a snatch pull variations from from the hip from the knee and go into the, the hang hang power snatch variations and slowly and incrementally uh, work down to the floor. Again, bearing in mind if they really are struggling with a slow controlled first pull to the knee and then that rapid acceleration and something's breaking down, they're overthinking it, which is easy to see with you know athletes that haven't really done weightlifting before, we can still get all the benefits of doing those other variations using that top-down approach going from mid-thigh or the hip or down to the knee. So we don't necessarily have to teach athletes to do all of the different weightlifting variations. That would be ideal. And in a long-term athlete development approach and that long-term athlete development model, hopefully this would have been introduced at a young age and go right away throughout their training. So by the time they're a senior athlete, we can use everything we'd like to use with them. The reality is that rarely happens. And sometimes you go into a scenario, and I've had this numerous times, you go and work with a, a group of athletes, and I've been away walked by the training a few times and purely been asked to go and assist. When I'm not part of a team, but just asked to go and assist, can you come walk by the training? And every morning we're going to do a load of technique, a load of technique work with athletes. We want them better at the weightlifting exercises. We want them better at all squatting patterns, etc. The young athletes are great. The older athletes generally quite set in their ways so for them it's well what extra benefit can we get of doing a full clean or a full snatch compared to some of those other variations which i can teach them really quickly and we get increases in rapid force production characteristics from technique training if all you've ever done is heavy squats heavy deadlifts heavy hip hinges suddenly being really ballistic and explosive with a hang pull 
whether it's with a clean or a snatch grip or whether you actually go into a catch position, that can make a huge difference because you're just used to using heavy loads and moving them relatively slowly. So we get a decent training effect just going through this. And that, that might just be the first 20 minutes or 15 minutes of your training session. Again, where possible, um, I would say, well, instead of a 20, 30 minute pre-activation session with bands and lying on the floor or doing bands and all these sorts of things, I would get them to do a more um, dynamic body weight series of movement patterns, and then give them a barbell with whatever load is appropriate and get them practicing some of these techniques. The muscles will be fully active by the time you've done that. So we can easily integrate these things into the start of an individual's workout. We're not going to be using the loads which would seem to be optimal that we've already discussed. But if we start, you know, a whole squad off with 40 kilos on a barbell today, and we do X number of sets, X number of reps of an exercise for a few exercises, and that's your first 20 minutes before you go and do your your real absolute strength session uh, with the squats and everything you're confident at. The next time we come in, if we do an extra rep or two per set, or if we have an extra one and a half kilos or one and a quarter kilos to either side of the bar, We've got progressive overload. And if we do that week on week on week, we don't need to assess a one around. We can't because they're not competent, but we've applied progressive overload. <clears throat> we've done an extra set or an extra rep. We can only increase that so much, or we're suddenly training endurance, etc. But we can add a little bit more weight, take the reps up, add a bit more weight, bring the repetitions down, and just slowly and systematically do that. Some athletes, you might stop with something like a hang power clean, hang power snatch. Others, you might go all the way down to the floor and give them that full, full array. But normally that sort of the, the top-down approach seems to work best, giving them efficient and effective feedback. And th this is one of the key things is not over-coaching the athlete. I see this when, when we coach our students to become coaches and we coach them through weightlifting exercises, you know, they're almost looking at, well, these, this is the technical model. And then, then explaining to their athlete the technical model, you no. Know, the athlete doesn't have time to think of that. What do they need to do? Why did that exercise go wrong? Why was the bar in front of them? Was their start position incorrect? Were the hips too high? Uh, were the hips too low? What, what was going wrong? Did they just rip the bar off the floor and they lost posture? And therefore, you know, once, the, once they performed the first pull, there was, there was no way of correcting it. So what do we need to do with those athletes? And we need to give them one or two cues, something simple to think about. And also not just give them the negative feedback we've got to give them the positive feedback what went well get them to buy in as soon as you're saying right that's great that's really explosive you know you're moving really quickly then you can throw in the however try not to start that transition phase until a little bit later or try and get your you know your chest and your trunk more upright as you go into that transition phase to start the second part of the exercise and also, you know, we're really not lucky now. Most people have got smart devices, whether it's a phone or whether it's a tablet. So it's really easy with the athlete's permission to film them and show them it. You know, sometimes you're explaining stuff and they just don't grasp what you're saying. And if you can show them what it looks like and what it should look like, sometimes they self-correct. Uh, one of the useful things that, that we find is getting athletes to coach each other and give each other feedback. There's rarely enough coaching staff in the room to coach every individual athlete. <clears throat> so get them to coach each other that will mean they're more conscious of their technique while they're also you know giving feedback and acting as a coach for their training partner or partners yeah that's really good but also fun sometimes so definitely and yeah. yeah and especially when you've got some athletes who may you know may not be so focused and they're messing around a little bit in the gym and you've got to you know install still a little bit of discipline actually they're not getting distracted they're not getting bored because they're coaching the other person and if they've criticized the technique of, of their training partner, they'll make sure that they damn well get it right themselves. Otherwise, their training partner is going to start to ridicule them a little bit. And it's also good with youth athletes. It gets the buy-in with youth athletes. It helps them as they develop and progress through their careers. Some of them may decide, you know what, I'm, I'm not, not going to get to the level I want to in sport, but now I could go and be the coach. I want to learn. I want to go and do that because I enjoy doing that part of it. And it's, it's empowering for them. So important. Anything you want to say about stages of learning? No, I think the, the one thing to bear in mind in terms of sort of the coaches and, and the stages of learning for athletes is that we can't just go on, some people will go on chronological age, but we can't do that because as I said, you could have, you know, if we look at how athletes learn and how they develop, if we could have an athlete who's 12 years old, who's already had some experience of all these exercises. We can have an athlete who's in their 20s who's never performed them. So we have to go through the same sort of normal stages and the normal process, 
but accelerate them through that learning process as they develop. Now, that's difficult if you've got a whole squad of athletes because they'll all develop at different rates, but we have to try and individualize that as much as possible and, and where possible, uh, making sure we give them the, the appropriate feedback to write that. And don't progress them too rapidly. I think people always want to, I'm, I know I'm like this with students and with athletes, I want to get to the exciting stuff. But actually, they've got a really good foundation on everything else first. But at the same time, we need to add enough variation and variety to keep keep them interested at the same time as well. Yeah, that's true. Thank you so much for, for going through these ones. Now we have the questions, the two questions I always ask at the end. The first one is, what is your favorite color? I don't really have a favorite color. It, I, I suppose it, it sort of depends on so if I was going to paint my house, what color do I, would I paint it? No, so I, will tell you, I will tell you specifically what why I ask. So Evidence Strong started with me making infographics for research papers. So if I would make an infographic for this paper, which I certainly will, what color you would like to see on the infographic? Red. Something that stands out. All right. Well, no. so as I said, you know, Talk, think about favorite colors. I wouldn't paint my house red, and I probably don't really wear much red, but it depends on the purpose. <laughs> okay, noted. The infographic will have some red on it. And now the second question is where people can find you or where they should follow you anymore. My work's probably easiest to find on ResearchGate. If they want to follow me, Instagram or Twitter, at Paul Comfort 1975, which gives away my age, but that's fine. All right then. Well, thank you so, so much for tonight and see you next time. Brilliant. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.